Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth plenary, Decolonization and Indigenization. I'm Leah Potterwaite. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Kavira Coalition. We'll start today's uh, plenary with a land acknowledgement. So please, I invite you to find a comfortable position, land into your bodies, into your breath, feel your connection to the earth. We're all calling in from around the world and we still have bodies and our bodies are on land and the land has history. We lift up our gratitude to the ancestors, to the elders, to Mother Earth and all her beings for their generous and crucial guidance. I acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and present day homelands of the Tewa, Toa, Tiwa and Kara speaking Pueblos and the Hickory Apache. I invite you to consider the original inhabitants where you live. Indigenous peoples are the original stewards of this land. Their lineages of knowledge allowed communities to flourish since time immemorial while supporting the health of Mother Earth. Colonization disrupted this, bringing land theft, genocide, and appropriation. And Indigenous peoples since that time have resisted, organized, and continue to offer a way out. Their ancestral knowledge and leadership are the guidance we need to move, to move out of this epic of violence, violence against each other and violence against the earth. We commit to standing in solidarity with indigenous peoples and to actions that support indigenous led movements. We also offer our thoughts, prayers and actions at this time to indigenous peoples who are experiencing exacerbated impacts of COVID-19 due, due to longstanding histories of injustice. Land acknowledgements are just the beginning. They are the seed of the necessary action. I invite you all to enter your own land acknowledgement in the chat box, including your name and tribal affiliations. Also, we'll enter some resources there that can help explain land acknowledgements and provide general information on the original inhabitants where you are. Also, we're including some indigenous led movements, organizations and initiatives to learn about some of which are stewarded by speakers in this panel and speakers in previous conference sessions. We encourage you to learn about indigenous led movements right where you are too. And we invite you to spend your time, energy and resources to support these movements. And as many of you know by now, we've partnered with the outside to design these conference sessions with uh, participation and inclusion at the forefront. And so I wanna welcome Brona Gallagher from the outside who's gonna help us um, help frame the process for us today. So thank you, Brona. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you for bringing us into this session. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for some of you and wherever you all are today. I'm absolutely delighted to be co-facilitating the session uh, with and for you all. Uh, with some of the folks involved in the film gather um, and really bring us into the topic of decolonization and indigenization. Uh, I watched the film at the weekend. Um, it's an incredible story and I can't wait to hear uh, what the folks offer us today. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna find it plenty engaging as well. Uh, and so I just wanted to speak a little to um, why this topic firstly, why Regenerate wanted to have this conversation and I think, Leah, actually, you really captured some of that as, as you brought us in with your land acknowledgement. Uh, for Regenerate, really recognizing that the panelists, um, the film itself uh, helps us kind of uh, recognize that this moment that we're in uh, globally and collectively really is um, we're facing multiple intersecting crises, biodiversity, climate breakdown, inequity, uh, and it is not going to be possible to get our way out of these uh, situations and issues with the same thinking that got us there. Uh, we are fundamentally being called on to, to approach different worldviews and ways of understanding uh, and being and doing in the world. Uh, and Indigenous communities uh, offer, offer that way for us, offer signposts and directions and learning and wisdom that can help, uh, help guide us and help offer us different ways of thinking about things as we move forward from this. And of course, off, also offer a sense of a mirror uh, into our present and helping us see that the, the reality that we all currently live in is very much born out of past and historical dynamics. And we need to kind of understand and recognize those uh, as we seek to move on as well. Um, 
So that's the kind of the why of this conversation or like what uh, the purpose of it is. Recognizing that these terms, decolonization, indigenization, are massive and huge and likely maybe a bit unfamiliar to some of you, or, uh, you know, already you can kind of feel responses or feelings, thoughts around what these terms are. Uh, all of those are welcomed, completely understandable. Um, I will speak a bit more in a little minute around how we'd like to hold this session, but at this stage, just to kind of say uh, a real invitation and encouragement to, to lean in to what we're about to kind of hear and um, listen to together, that this is a real space for learning um, and we encourage you to do so. I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to speak like specifically to Kavera, uh, his own relationship with this conversation. Thanks, Brona. Um, I'm going to be pretty uh, brief because I know time is of the essence. Um, I am uh, at Polk's Folly Farm, which is on the traditional homelands of the Tano and Tiwa people. Um, uh, and um, in terms of uh, Kavira's relationship to these conversations, uh, I think that this is um, for us a burgeoning um, exploration of what uh, decolonization and indigenization mean. Um, it's been a topic of conversation among our staff uh, for at least the last year um, in, a, in a real directed way. Um, and I guess I just wanna say that um, we're committed to uh, understanding what those things mean, as well as um, working in partnership uh, and relationship with uh, tribes where we do work. Um, and uh, I think that, that that means a lot of different things, but in this moment in particular, I think it means uh, sort of recognizing what is the history of specifically New Mexico, um, but we also work in Montana and in Colorado, so those places as well, um, and beginning to build relationships and uh, understanding how, how we can um, lean into indigenous-led efforts for land stewardship uh, in, its, in its essence. Um, I'm really grateful to everybody on the panel who is here today. Um, that you were so generous to screen this film for our audience. It means a ton. Uh, I invited my entire family to watch last night and they did and that was really fantastic. Um, so thank you. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about really quickly before we dive deeper into the panel is um, I wanted to acknowledge also that today is uh, Veterans Day um, and that's a, I, I recognize that that's a complicated holiday for a lot of folks. Um, I did a little bit of reading about it uh, before we jumped on and um, it initially uh, was Armistice Day and it was supposed to day, be a day of, of peace, of um, putting arms down and recognizing uh, the um, sacrifices that people made to have that peace happen. And I think that that's sort of the spirit with which I'd like to um, recognize that day and recognize uh, all of the folks who have, um, who have, uh, who are veterans who have um, uh, been in service and, uh, and in service to, I, I hope, ideally getting us to a place of peace. So um, for those of you who have served, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, really deeply felt and deeply appreciated. And I think with that, I will turn it back over to Leah and Brona. Thank you, Sarah. So today's panel gives us an opportunity to learn from folks who can provide direction as to what needs to change and clues as to how to do it. Um, many of you have watched the film Gather previously. And I know you're all probably eager to hear from our panelists. And if you haven't watched it, I definitely recommend watching it. Um, it's available for streaming on a number of platforms. And we're going to put a link to the website, which has all of those different platforms listed on it. 
um, if, if one of my colleagues could put the link in the chat. Um, and even if you haven't seen it, this plenary has a ton to teach us all. So I'm gonna briefly, very briefly introduce our panelists and their connections to the film gather. And uh, it seems, it goes without saying, but I'll say it, uh, they've done so much in addition to this film and we're gonna put their longer bios in the chat box. And then in a few minutes, we're actually gonna have them uh, do longer introductions for themselves. So, so our panelists today include Ade Briones, and Ade is the executive producer of Gather, born and raised in Cocha de Pueblo, New Mexico. Um, also director of the Native Agriculture and Food Systems Program at the First Nations Development Institute. And then we have Sanjay Rawal, who's the director of Gather and with an amazing track record of food and equity focused films, definitely check out what he's done. And then the next two panelists, I'm guessing you might recognize if you've seen the film, we have Elsie Debray, who grew up raising and studying buffalo with her family in the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation and is now a junior at Stanford. And last and certainly not least, we have Twyla Casador, who is a skilled forager addressing health and social issues through recording the knowledge of elders and helping indigenous people return to native diets. Their film Gather is a powerful testament to new and old ways and is an intimate portrait of the growing movement amongst indigenous peoples to reclaim their spiritual, political, and cultural identities through food sovereignty while battling the trauma of centuries of genocide and colonization. Colonization that continues to this day. Our path out of violence and climate disaster is a path led by leaders that are indigenous, black, and people of color. I wanna thank everyone that made this plenary possible. The panelists, staff, volunteers, sponsors, you the participants, and our ancestors. I want to give a special shout out to Ariel Quintana of Cocha de Pueblo, who dreamed up the concept of this panel and is the person who made it all possible. And I will hand it back to Brona now, who's going to walk us through the agenda and the process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. All right, moving us on. Folks, here's our agenda for the day, but I wanted to just say a really quick um, sentence or two around the how of this conversation, uh, that we are holding it with a little bit of intention to, uh, to be a, in, a, in a slightly different way. We've had some incredible panelists and speakers. It's been a really great conference so far. And we also recognize that these can be quite heady spaces and we're really in a space of intellectualizing and you know, arguing and listening for right or wrong. And we're encouraging and inviting just a slightly different stepping into this, into this conversation particularly. So just to kind of like name three words that we'd love to carry into the conversations as we go forward. One is around presence into the conversation. Uh, conferences at home are great, but they're also plenty distracting. And so as much as possible, we would really invite and encourage, uh, you know, to just try and be present to, to this conversation for the next two hours. We'd love to invite a, a sense of deeper listening to kind of going beyond that I agree, I disagree, but what does that mean? Into just this kind of like slightly more open space and way of hearing uh, the conversations that we're about to have. And finally, we recognize that panels can be uh, almost a little extractive or certainly transactional. Folks offer some stuff to think about. We offer some questions, that's it, everybody goes home. And uh, we wanna actually just try and hold a little bit or cultivate a bit of space that's around gratitude, uh, reciprocity and appreciation that we are in this little collective space together, sharing and learning and everybody's bringing in and offering stuff. And so we're just gonna like, gently keep a little intention around that stuff as we go through today. Um, and we hope that it feels good and okay for you. And, and if not, we also understand our process for today. Welcome and framing, we are nearly done, don't worry. We're gonna invite you to check in, uh, which will be familiar to most of you by this stage and we'll speak it through really quickly. We'll hand over to the speakers or we'll uh, kind of uh, support the speakers to introduce themselves, to hear a little bit more about their work. And then we'll kind of shift that into a fuller panel discussion. There'll be a little space for Q&A, so you get a chance to offer some questions or ask some questions before moving into discussion groups. Um, and with the, some final closing words from our speakers uh, and the checkout. With the discussion groups, we'd really encourage you to stay on uh, as a sense of like, these are real spaces of integration in terms of what you've been learning. It's a great chance to build community and a really uh, good space to be in a place of unlearning and learning, especially in the context of this conversation. 
folks, I'm going to move us through this stuff relatively quickly, by which to say, you know, this is a shared space, please participate thoughtfully and well. Uh, I know there's been online guidance. Uh, there is going to be tech support available. So in the main, if you are struggling with, I don't know what's happening here, look out for people that have volunteer or co-host, drop them a little private message and they'll be able to orientate you. Uh, for those of you on the phone, there is a phone number and it is 505-393-1355. So if you're kind of stuck with technology, that's your best way of kind of getting, uh, getting your questions answered. All right, we're in. So friends, we wanted to offer uh, a little check-in practice and we wanted to do so in a spirit of like gratitudes uh, of what we're coming in with today. As before, or if you've not done it before, it is, uh, we just ask you to type it into the chat box if you feel comfortable and able. And if not, you can just, where you are, speak it, write it down, wherever you wanna be. And so the question that we'd love you to check in around today is like, what is a gratitude you want to offer? To the earth? to family, to friends, to other beings, but what is a gratitude you want to offer into this space? And into the chat box, tribal affiliation and a few words. got a shared learning experience for the beautiful shining fractal frost on prairie plains this morning. Yes, for the sacredness of all beings. Uh, no tribal affiliation, but I reside in the Zen uh, ancestral lands of the Yakima Hood and Warm Springs tribe. I am grateful for the quenching rains of the last few days. Grateful for a warm and peaceful community for what the earth offers us. So friends, I'm gonna invite those to keep coming in just as a good practice to be in together. Um, and I'm gonna keep this moving. And we are we're keeping a record of the chat. And so this will be a lovely record of, of the gratitudes we're offering into this space. Leah, is that right? I think so. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move into some introductions from the panelists. So. Each panelist is involved in the film in a number of different ways. And of course, they all have unique backgrounds and experiences that lend to the unique impacts they bring to the film. So we're gonna hear about five minutes each from each panelist and um, we can just jump right in. If one of you wants to jump in, otherwise I can, I can call on one of you. All right, I'm gonna call on Elsie. Alrighty, I should have known that was coming. Midakuye on petu kinle chante washte na pechi uza pech sto. Elsie Dubre machi al pech sto na wak pa washte he machi al taha sto na o ohenumba malakota na nueta na heratsa he macha. Stanford University al wablaye sto na wana el wanie tu yamni wounds be mich ie sto palami al pech sto. My relatives this day, I greet you with a good heart. Um, my name is Elsie Dubray. I am from Cheyenne River. I am Oohanumpa or Two Kettles Lakota, Nueta, and Hiratsa. Um, I am currently at Stanford University. Well, not currently there, there, but um, I am. I have been attending Stanford University. Currently, I've been learning here for three years. Um, and thank you all. Um, as Leah mentioned, and as some of you may know, I was featured in the film Gather. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be able to share thoughts in this space with everybody here today. Um, I am constantly learning from everybody um, whom I've been able to connect with through this film. I am so deeply um, grateful for for those experiences and for those connections and relationships. Um, and I, I would just like to note that I am not um, speaking for anyone other than myself. Um, I do not represent 
um, my people, um, and I cannot possibly speak for what everybody has to say, um, but I, I do hope to, to honor, um, honor ancestors when I speak. And um, I like science, but currently I have um, taken a bit of a break from that and have been um, diving a little bit deeper into the, um, <clears throat> deeper into food sovereignty, um, indigenous food sovereignty initiatives, um, thinking about how what my family's work um, has been and how my own research and interests fit into that and how I can best contribute um, on a local level and use the platform that this film has sort of given me to, to help that, um, help facilitate other initiatives on a more, facilitate and support other initiatives um, on, a, on a larger scale. Um, so again, thank you everybody for, for holding this space for me. Thank you, Elsie, and thanks for uplifting that reality of no single person speaking for a whole, whole group and appreciate you being here. And Twyla, would you like to go next? Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning and good day. My name is Twyla Castador. I am from the Tall, people, Tall Peaks People Clan from, and I'm from the San Carlos Apache tribe. I am a cult, I am a cultural project assistant for our tribe as well as a traditional food harvester and educator and knowledge keeper for our community. It's really been an absolute honor to be working with everyone on this film as well as, you know, just seeing what we're all doing out there throughout the world, you know, and, and revitalizing a lot of our traditional food ways and knowledge and, and using those knowledge to help address a lot of the, how would you say, a lot of the <clears throat> health crisis in our communities and using that knowledge to help, help us resolve a lot of those um, issues and to work forward so it's really been, okay. I've never been given this much time before to speak. So it's really exciting to be able to speak. <laughs> so I wanna say thank you to Sanjay, the crew, um, to your organization for allowing us the time and space to be here. Again, my, my position in this community and in this life is to reteach and reconnect not only the youth but also commun community members back to our traditional food ways, as well as using it as a way of healing from how you say several levels of trauma that a lot of us endure and we keep quiet about and we don't talk about a lot of these traumas in our lives and livelihood, but being able to use that knowledge in place of today's um, how, how would you say, clinical setting, but using our traditional knowledge to help us heal and move forward. So that's what I do. Thank you so much, Twyla, for your important work. Um, and a day, would you like to go next? Gwati se hopa in waka nima asa white yats koti dime osuta. Oi, Mahada. Um, I'm my name's Ade, and welcome um, to this panel and to this space. It's always a good place to be when you see many Indigenous people together. Um, whenever I see a whole bunch of Indigenous people together, I always say that's where I want to be. So, welcome to this beautiful space. Mm -hmm. And uh, I work for First Nations Development Institute. I'm the director of the Food and Agriculture Program. I am Kochiti in Kiowa. I am now um, in my husband's homelands, which um, are in California. He is Pomo and Native Hawaiian, and we're raising our kids here. But of course, I have to give the shout out to um, my Kochiti sister, who is Ariel. She's out there somewhere. And to all the other friends who are, um, all the other indigenous people who are out there. I know uh, there's a woman named Lucille, who's, um, she has a cameo in the film 
via the buffalo she raises. And so uh, of course, thank her, she's on Pine Ridge, thank her for being out there. And I'm not gonna get into um, an introduction, but I do wanna acknowledge that, you know, Twyla and Elsie and I both started the panel in, with introductions in our languages. And just for those out there who are not indigenous, like that's really important when you enter a space and you're talking to people to kind of start the frame, like that's the start, right? That's the start of our conversation. We're, we're indigenizing the space. We are introducing ourselves in our language and just recognizing everybody that came before us and all, and we're kind of fertilizing the ground so that the words and the concepts and the conversation that we have always starts off in a good place. And again, so you're in a good place, you're with indigenous people who, who began um, the conversation in our language, which is a really, really important um, protocol. So welcome and I look forward to um, having more conversations with all of you via chat or via um, questions or even um, telepathy, <laughs> however that works on the internet. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sort of bringing the, the language piece right up front. Really appreciate that. And Sanjay, last and certainly not least. Well, I, I don't really have a, 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 an introduction for myself, but I just wanted to say how thankful I am to have made this film with Twyla, Elsie, and Aday. And again, I also want to say a big hello and send hugs to Lucille. And I think I see Ed Ironcloud kind of peeking out in her background. Um, there's some, some of their wonderful uh, herd of buffalo in the film. Um, we we're grateful to spend time and break bread with them on their traditional homelands. And uh, again, thank you for, for giving us this platform. Thank you so much, Sanjay. All right, I am going to pass it back to Brona. Thank you, Lena. Uh, and thank you panelists for bringing yourselves in and we're, we're just about to move on really into some big conversation like to give you a space to have uh, what I know is going to be an incredible conversation I know that you just kind of bounce off each other and yeah and before we go into that sort of uh, just letting you guys freestyle I think we were very aware that again it's just quite easy particularly in a virtual space to be like yeah you know cool I can hear folks but I'm not really kind of like listening or paying attention and we, uh, we just wanted to kind of invite a, a level of listening. Um, so I touched on it at the beginning and uh, there's a sense that, you know, we can listen for what's right or wrong. We can just listen, we can listen to empathize and uh, understand the world from other people's uh, worldview, but we can also listen with a sense of trying to create something that's between us. Uh, and that that's something is leading us into an emerging future. So this sense of like generative listening, uh, of really listening with an openness that lets something new to emerge from both the, the storyteller, the speaker, and from us, the audience and participants in this case. And we know it's virtual, but it's still very much a, an offer and an invitation to try and hold the conversation, uh, to listen into the conversation that we're about to listen into with that sort of intention. And so just to do so, I'd love to just take, you know, five, five deep breaths with you all with a sense of like open mind, open heart and open will. And then I will uh, offer a question over to the panelists and we can, uh, we can uh, have this conversation. So just five breaths. And so I'll just share, share my screen just so you all can see the question, but we'll take it down. So when the, when we start to hear. Thank you. Thank you. So folks, we'll just put this in the middle for whoever wants to start and we can kind of like, yeah, just take it from there. Just offer encouragement invitation to take this conversation whatever way works for you all at this time uh, and so what for you is the difference between uh, food sovereignty and food security and I guess why is that important and so that is our question I, I totally nominate Elsie to start on this <laughs> yeah excellent <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I guess I can't refuse. Um, well, there's a fundamental difference between the two. And I think it's really important that that gets acknowledged because I think a lot of the time they're kind of used synonymously. And I think that can be really damaging because when we're talking about food security, we're talking about like having enough food, having enough calories to subsist and to exist on in like in our daily activities and our daily life. Um, it says nothing about how that's happening or the quality of that food. And food sovereignty has been defined in all sorts of places. And I think um, the like official declaration for a definition came out in 2006, but I think it was in the 70s that a group of um, global indigenous farmers kind of created terminology surrounding it. Um, but it, it refers to culturally relevant and meaningful foods that are obtained in culturally relevant ways, which implies um, harmony with the ecosystems from which they are uh, harvested from. Um, and so it, it is an embodiment of a, all sorts of um, traditional concepts and, um, and beliefs um, and, and indigenous worldview when you're talking about indigenous food sovereignty. And so if, I mean, I like to think about a difference being, um, being like government food rations on reservations when you have uh, flour and lard and sugar um, to give calories um, being that that was an effort of food security. I mean, it didn't, it was not, we don't have to yet to get into the depths of how problematic that um, problematic that was, but that that was not that's food security. That's having enough um, sometimes um, to eat and more um, more recently, like the uh, food distribution on um, Indian reservations, the, the program for that, the FDIPR. Um, a lot of the time that food is not particularly fantastic food and there's not often times there's not enough of it or um, it's all full of preservatives and commodity foods and, and whatnot. That's food security. Those are efforts to try to make sure people have enough food to live. And that's the bare minimum. And I mean, it's really important and food security is absolutely a necessary component of food sovereignty. But when you're talking about food sovereignty, you're talking about the liberation of people and you're talking about people's inherent rights um, to hunt and forage and gather um, and to, to pray and to have access to not only that food, but to that, to that lifestyle and to those traditions and that ancestral knowledge. Um, and so I think that's maybe an, a little introduction to, to a difference that um, a day and, and Twyla for sure can certainly speak um, a lot to. Twyla, I'll, I'll just say a few things and then I'll pass it to you. Okay, Twyla? So um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just prepping Twyla for all her um, awesome comments because she always has a lot. So I think Elsie delved into it, but I'm going to tell you a short story. Okay, and it's about the American food system. Um, when COVID-19 happened in March, of course, everybody remembers the toilet toilet paper craze, everybody running to the store to get toilet paper. Um, and that same thing happened with food, right? We saw disruptions in the meat industry, and then we saw disruptions in produce. And really, these are, we're talking about commercial supply chains. And we've I've talked to Twyla a bit. Um, on average, a person, in Indian country has to drive at least 35 miles to the nearest grocery store, if not more. So there's some places that have to drive 90 miles to the nearest grocery store. So that means that the supply chain doesn't even reach us, that we actually have to travel to the end of that supply chain in order to, to get the goods or stuff that we need, including food. So then when the COVID happened and the supply chain was disrupted, 
the silk food and toilet paper didn't make it to the end of that supply chain. So that means that there were food shortages in many places around Indian country. And so the response was, okay, National Guard, we need to load our trucks with um, foodstuffs and get them to the reservations because people need food. Internally, Indian people were saying, we need more seeds, we need to have more butchers, we need to make sure our animals are healthy so that we can like make it through the winter. And to me, that's the stark difference between food security and food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is an internal conversation that ensures resilience, that ensures the people are caring for themselves and are able to access food regardless of what's happening outside of that community. The government response and the outside response to ship food into our communities only exacerbates the inequalities that already exist in the system. And it only, it kind of amplifies um, everything that's wrong with the system, right? Because somebody has to pay for that gas. Somebody has to pay for the refrigeration. Somebody has to pay for um, the supply chain to actually get that food into one place. Like logistically, it's a nightmare. Um, and it, 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 it all just speaks to the type of food system that um, kind of left us out in the first place. And so really food security and food sovereignty to me is, a, is the difference between the mindset of a people. And when we're talking about food sovereignty, we're asking the people themselves for answers. And so Elsie is the best at giving like really good definitions. And then, um, but I think Twyla, Twyla to me like embodies food sovereignty because she's like, I want to go get pine nuts and coda and <laughs> acorns and everything. I mean, <laughs> so I'm gonna pass it to Twyla now. The only way I can explain um, food sovereignty and food security. <clears throat> this is, I would say, my, let me fix this real quickly. This is um this, this is beautiful. This is my food security. This this ensures that my family will always be fed, regardless of what situation thrives in globally. Um, when you're talking about food security, yes. There's that big concern about not being able to get access to the food that we're so accustomed to today, which is basically processed unhealthy food. And that's what was given to us during this pandemic and minimizing that overall health of the, the food that we're kind of used to. So we're talking about um, food sovereignty. This is my food sovereignty also. This is beautiful corn. And one thing was came about during this pandemic is people didn't look at like, we have to go no distance to go buy food and large amount of food to store. People in this community started taking leaves off of their shelves and planting them. And that was, even though it's a horrible thing that is happening, that's the most beautiful thing I've seen come out of this is seeing people reconnect back with the land. There, more people were planting, more people were harvesting, more people were collecting seeds, nuts, berries, grains that are all around us that a lot of us kind of forgot, but seeing people embrace that traditional knowledge again to be able to go out and engage with their families and planting and engage with their neighbors and sharing seeds and engage with the other communities with um, trading 
with the seeing that traditional knowledge come alive again in such a unique way is it's been so so beautiful to see for me that is um food sovereignty and food security i like elsie i mean elsie is probably the best candidate to explain food sovereignty and food <laughs> security so i really i really love seeing where this young woman is going in her life you know one day i can see you know large slogan you know for her as a representative for us in, in indian country in that how you say in that scientific world and being able to portray and convey a lot of our knowledge that we're not able to convey to the outside world where she's able to share that same language with them and share the knowledge that we have but in a sense where the world will understand and maybe accept a lot of the suggestions that she may have for us so i hope i did answer something <laughs> So thank you. I have nothing to add that was extraordinarily comprehensive. Thank you all so much. Um, and so sort of taking us along in this conversation, I think in, in many ways, we can sort of see how food security comes along with colonization, food sovereignty with indigenization. And I think it could be really beneficial for a lot of the folks in the audience if we got into some like definitions, like what does decolonization mean to you? What does indigenization mean to you? And how, and, and can you provide some examples of what it looks like? Before we get into that question, I just want to say one thing about food sovereignty and food security that's really important. Yes, please. Like, um, you know, Elsie talked a little bit about the language and how sometimes they're used synonymously. But when we look at like the mainstream food system and sort of like the global domination of the American food system on local food systems, they use the term food security a lot, right? Like that's used to justify um, like overproduction. It's used to justify like um, you know, American food companies supplying other countries with food. Um, and it, there's a term called Tide Aid where like the food actually given to like other places is, is paid for um, by some tax dollars. You know, so like the idea, so the food sovereignty and food security, we're talking about it in indigenous communities, but it's really important to understand the differences when we think about envisioning what kind of food system we want to live in, because a lot of the language and nomenclature is tied to certain pedagogies that are then used to like establish this global empire of food that's sometimes really damaging to local communities and particularly indigenous communities across the globe. So I'm, I just had to add that, so sorry, but please ask your question one more time so people don't get confused. I think that that's a super important point and actually really helps lead into this next portion because I think it helps explain how colonization can take really covert forms. It can be hard to see sometimes when it's disguised as a term like food security. Um, so. Yeah, so the, the question I was sort of posing to the group is, um, can you help define decolonization and indigenization and how they relate and provide some examples of, of what they are? I have one thing to note that's kind of a bridge between the last question and this question, and it goes off of what Ade was saying about the importance of, um, of language and terminology is, and the, I, I don't take credit for this, I think it was, um, it may have been Chef Nephi in the film or somebody in the film um, talks about the language of food deserts um, in reference to, um, to indigenous communities. So a lot of the time on our home reservations, on our, on our homelands, um, where um, we may be from, like I'm 60 miles away from a grocery store right now 
yet in my backyard, I have food that would sustain me forever if I were to lose touch with the outside world. And so that was a, that was a language switch that the film illuminated to me and how I think about it because yes, technically the definition I think for a food desert is living more than 10 miles away from a grocery store. I'm like, that's almost like this entire reservation unless you live like in a in, um, in town. Um, but that I think this kind of gets at um, indigenizing this concept and how we and how we think about it. Um, because if we're thinking about it from this kind of colonial um, or like standpoint um, in where we don't have access to the grocery store that's selling us chips um, and frozen dinners. And um, if we're lucky in, in a lot of these places, maybe some produce, some good produce and not that all grocery stores have trash food or anything, but um, if we're thinking about it in that standpoint and like grocery stores are our only place to get food, then yeah, we do live in a food desert. But like by definition, if you think about it, like a food desert, like there's food all around us, even in, in, even in those communities or in these towns where there are grocery stores and there are people who always go hunting for game, who go digging teamsala, um, who, who harvest choke cherries and, and June berries and, and all sorts of things. And so that was something I was really grateful um, for and that helped me indigenize my own language because in this type of food sovereignty um, realm, um, that term gets thrown around a lot and often with good intentions. But I think, um, I think that kind of indigenization of the concept can be really um, can be really beneficial in, for for indigenous people and communities and um, and non-indigenous people as well. So that's just kind of a some food for thought as like a segue into um, into these definitions. I'm, I'm going to totally jump in here because like Elsie just hit like my nerve this like so I get so annoyed with the term food desert and I'm talking to people Kiveras in New Mexico we're considered high desert right I was born and raised in the desert and um, when I first heard that term food desert I, I don't know I was probably like 1920 and I was like yes food desert right because I live in the desert <laughs> and I there's food all around us and I had no idea what it meant. Um, so I was sort of excited about it because I, you know, I didn't know it means like the absence of food until I really started thinking, looking into the definition and they really mean food retail desert, right? It doesn't really mean like food desert. It just means like the absence of retail stores, which um, to me is sort of like a good thing, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't necessarily want to participate in like food capitalism, but when we think about a desert, like, I don't know, in my community, I think they did a study like around our area, there was like 200 different kinds of bees, which are like the most um, diverse populations of bees are found in the desert. Like some of the most diverse plants are found in deserts. And I don't know if you like, for all of you people in New Mexico, I know you can like totally feel me on this one, but like when you're growing up in a desert, like you are tough. Not only are you beat down by the winter and the sun, like whatever is growing in that desert is probably the toughest and most resilient kind of plant, people or animal that you're going to come across. And so me, like a food desert is, it means food retail desert. Like they got, USDA got their terms all mixed up and used the wrong words. And so like that, to me, that's just like, and I know I've heard the other term was like food apartheid, like these are, they're trying to de describe like just the absence of retail and the absence of participation in this capitalist system, which isn't necessarily a bad thing to me. Like my people will take care of ourselves regardless of whether we have to participate in the cash economy, but that Elsie, you're right, that's totally unrecognized in the way they use the term. I, I should add also, if people don't mind, a little context of, of the power of supply chain retail. Walmart three years ago did about $460 billion in gross revenue. About $360 billion of that was from their grocery division. And just as a frame of reference, three years ago, globally, Google grossed about $36 billion 
in revenue. And people will say like tech companies make a greater share of, of, of profits in their margins. Um, typically grocery makes anywhere between three and 7%. Walmart grocery made far more profit than Google. And, and the key term in all of this is not monopoly. There's a term called monopsony, which people have written about with regard to Amazon. It's not so much your power facing the consumer. A monopoly, of course, is one entity where that, that controls the entire supply to consumers. A monopsony controls the supply chain. When you're a monopsony, you don't have to control 100% of the supply chain. Economists have, have realized that if a, if a company controls about 30% of the overall market, more often than not, they've created a monopsony below them. And, and what does that mean? It means that one company that just controls about 30% of the supply chain dictates the entire process that food is created. 1986, Walmart entered into the grocery business and they changed the game. They basically said, we're going to buy in bigger volumes than anyone ever has, and we're gonna cut our margins down phenomenally. And for farmers, if they wanted to continue selling to Walmart, they had to accept these terms and they had to grow in size. Other grocery stores that then wanted to be able to offer the low prices of Walmart had to consolidate. So in the 1980s, there were 50 or 60 major, super, major supermarket chains. Now, five or six control almost 80% of that supply chain. And when you have just a few actors controlling the supply chain, smaller voices aren't heard. Voices that are economically marginalized are not heard. And there's no regulation for the US global food system, just as a, as a way to cap this with all the, um, the rhetoric about supporting the American farmer, there is no law in place that emphasizes Wal or that, that, that would incentivize Walmart from buying from a US supplier versus a supplier outside the US. Walmart is only buying by price. And when you have, when you have systems like that, you know, the food supply chain becomes incredibly homogenous. You lose land, you lose all concepts of regenerative, you lose incentives for anyone in the cash economy to be a part of that supply chain. And ultimately it's like food sovereignty exists outside that cash economy because by nature it can't exist within it. And just, just to add to that comment, so, so at First Nations, we did, so food price, I, I'm sure people are interested in food systems, whether you be a producer or a processor or somebody who consumes food, like food price is a weirdo thing, right? Like it makes no sense to me. So I, did, I went to school and I studied economics and they give you these pretty graphs and tell you how like relationships are supposed to work and like, the perfect price is the, the Pareto tube principle, right where you know supply and demand meet. But when you look at food prices, like it, they just like make no sense, right? <laughs> like we did a study in at First Nations about food prices in Indian country, and we found that on average, um, you know, prices were at least five cents higher. And when you're talking about five cents on one commodity, you're looking at like, like a basket is probably like 30 items over like multiplied by the number of people. And the, you know, the, the economic principle is that if there's more demand, right, price would go down. But in food, we don't see that, right? We see if there's more demand, actually price goes. So, I mean, it just, it depends on the retailer and it depends on the market. Like there's no steadfast rules when it comes to food price, which, create, which in itself is a vulnerability for people everywhere. And um, because you can't really make sense. Like in natural systems, you have like cycles, you can make sense of them. But in retail food price systems, there, there's so many factors, there's no way for somebody to actually figure that out. That's why we have the, the index, the bureau, the labor statistics who really keeps tracks of those prices. But the interesting thing when we did the study on food prices in Indian country, we found like on average, everything was more ex expensive except 
or the hot Cheetos, which were on average 50 cents less than anywhere else in the country. As, 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 as one last little point as well, at least in my own opinion, food security doesn't involve the presence of people. It's all supply chain driven projects appear mag magically out of nowhere with costs that have external factors that aren't factored into the actual price of the food. Does it include labor? Does it include human rights? Food sovereignty, because it collapses a supply chain, because everybody knows the quote producer, grower, chances are you're participating in that value chain yourself. You know, there is an aspect of equity. In food security, there is no aspect of equity throughout that supply chain. Most of it is subsidized. Most of it doesn't take into account all the environmental and labor externalities. I also see we have a um, Lucille who wants to um, say something. Lucille, if you wouldn't want to, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, um, my name is Lucille and I want to introduce my husband, Ed Ironcloud. He actually wanted to say something. Oh, good afternoon, uh, my relatives. Like I said, my, my name is Ed Ironcloud and I'm located here on a Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in a town called Porcupine. And I manage a, we manage a small buffalo herd here called Knife Chief Buffalo Nation Society. Um, it's a herd and we're doing exactly what everybody's talking about. You know, we're reconnecting with our relatives. And um, I just wanted to say that, you know, we talk about languages. Um, for example, the Lakota, you know, um, I'll give, for example, Sanjay. I met Sanjay a while back and we became friends. And so, in Lakota, he would be considered a kola. And you could say, well, friend, male to male means uh, kola and leave it at that. Or you could dive deeper and break down the word. And so the word kola, ko means to together. And then la means to travel. So you put those together, it's um, travels together with your friends, you know, on which, which guy when you have a friend you travel with them so that's there and the other word that's that uh it's interesting is called money water so money is but you say m m a ma in lakota this in this particular case it would be me and ni would be would mean um life like what you talk about they it, if it's in a word inipi inipi that the people call it the sweat lodge so it means me and then life. And so basically I, I say it as I want to live and that's what water is, you know? So I'm really, um, I really like it that, I mean, I'm really in, um, interested in, in the culture because everything we're talking about here can be flipped upside down in the indigenous, I mean, for me, and you can find words that you're, you're trying to express or not so much words, but a feeling. And I just wanted to bring that up, you know, and we were talking about languages here. If you, love, if you walk outside in your community, they're speaking a language. If you look at the animals and the plant life, they're speaking a language. If you look at the policy makers, they're speaking a language. And what my friend Kola Sandre just now shared was that language of Walmart and the interactions of what's going on there. And not many people understand that. And really, it's really exciting and it's really uh, um, interesting times here because we, us human race, we've never been this far in the future, you know? And all of these things are happening. I mean, me talking to you through the internet, the, the technology had this um, pandemic happen Chances are, maybe I wouldn't even met you guys, you know? So there's a, there's a, on one side, there's always hardship and, you know, people passing away, but on the other side, there's things that are good too. You know, there's a lesson in almost everything there in front of us. But, you know, I just wanted to share that and I'm really um, glad to meet you. And I'm really, you know, we do this work, what we do it's, it's not new, you know, people say, talk to me, just my own opinion, 
that it's new, but really from 2000 years ago, 20,000, three, 5,000 generations ago, that was what we're talking about was the main thing that they wanted. They wanted our futures to our future generations to be strong and to be able to take care of themselves and be able to think, you know, thoughts where it'll help them and to understand, you know, it's pretty complex, but that's what, that's what we want now. And we're all talking about bringing good, healthy food to people, to our, our, fu our futures. So when we're all gone, that these people will still be planting those seeds. And what's interesting here real quickly is that what is, is a, the, the stuff that goes in our minds, you know, the, the thoughts that we think. And that's what I find interesting about my community and where we're at is we, if we bring in all good, healthy food and we live before our people, then what are the healthy thoughts or healthy food that we bring to the mind? And that mind is gonna be determined whether it takes that food or not, you know? And so I'm really, you know, I'm really um, happy. I wish you all, you know, good day and good health for you and your family, because at the end of the day, that's all that matters, you know, to be able to think, to be able to hear, to be able to talk, to be able to feel, to be able to have water, you know, be able to have a roof over your head you know, be able to have family and children, you know, and be able to try to understand what's going around us, you know, is really, um, it's amazing. I think, you know, the human body and spirit's amazing, amazing, you know, so we'll just, so that we could, whatever problems come before us, we can basically um, find a solution to it. But I, um, I just wanted to say that much and thank you Sanjay for all your work there and for, for, uh, letting people see your work there and then all, all, all of you for whatever, whatever, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. I'm really thankful for you to be listening to me and um, wish you all a good, hope that you have good health and whatever you in search of that um, you're, you're doing. Um, I want to say something real quick here, but just uh, thinking out loud here, Sandre, I always thought a video, a good video would be that our, our relatives to the South, that Mexico, that, that, that tend to this food because to plant that seed and watch that seed come up and those hands that pick it up, every hand that touches that food until it reaches us. You know, a lot of times we think we, we just go to the store, we buy tomatoes and potatoes and it's just like, okay, you know, it's like we take it for granted, but there was a lot of people that touched that food and made it happen so we could have that food you know, but I always thought that would be a, to, to um, show the other side of our relatives to the south, what they have to go through, what they have to do to be able to, so that we don't take it for granted, the food that so many people have worked hard for, so that we could just have it and just go down to the store and buy it. So, all right, thank you very much. I just, you know, just had the idea um, just for whatever it's worth, you know, Kawopila for all that you, you all do. Thank you so much, Ed, what a gift, thank you. Um, and Twyla, do you wanna, um, we have a few more minutes here. Do you wanna sort of take us out and tell us what's on your mind in this conversation? The only way I can explain things to some people when you're looking at an indigenous perspective and I can only speak like, like how, how we say, you know, we can't speak for the people. But when people don't really understand the indigenous culture, and it's hard to convey those words about real sovereignty and security. I live... Um, Okay. I live in a community that that um we struggle with um, acceptance sometimes of different food that our ancestors grew up with. And when you showcase 
these foods. I mean, I was very touched by um, what the man was saying about all these different foods, and it resonated with me. I'm only going to talk about me, okay? We'll make it that simple. Okay. You showcase all these amazing food, and you get, you try to introduce it into the outside world, and you get feedback of... Um, Oh, they were so poor. Oh my gosh, they had to go dig for it. They had to go hunt for it. They can't even buy those food. And in my mind was, I thought people like lived like this. You know, I thought everybody did the same thing I did. I thought everybody lived the way I did. And when I got into the mainstream world, I never realized they looked it up as and it was so shocking and I never considered myself poor to be categorized that way but yet our culture is so indigenously traditionally wealthy in this knowledge and even though indigenous people are belittled and not quite accepted in that government platform of making decisions what's really beneficial to indigenous communities. And we have these Western colonized ideologies of how to better life for people in these indigenous communities without really looking at the policies that are being passed at these governmental levels of addressing the health crisis, food crisis, food security, food sovereignty, and what's allowable. So when this pandemic occurred, a lot of us were limited to go, you can't, for, you can't forage, you can't harvest. Some of my relatives were fined a thousand dollars just to go forage seeds and nuts and berries. They were fine. Um, it's something that I didn't think I would see during this time. And I'm, it's something I say we are learning from. It's not like I'm upset. I'm just disappointed that we haven't passed over these barriers in recognizing Indigenous needs over policies that are put in place to, I say, suppress indigenous culture. And doing so, I felt like they help suppress it a little more, but hoping that our leadership will take into consideration that this is our way of life. And we shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to go through these barriers to continue living our life. Um, I just want to share that part to maybe help some people understand that, you know, that, that it, it's a challenge, it's challenging to see policies and, you know, all these different levels of government not fully accept our way of life, even though we've been here from time immemorial. So thank you. Thank you so much, Twyla. That was really powerful. I feel like I'm tingling all over, so thank you. So we're going to now move into Q&A. Brona, do you wanna explain? Well, I did, and I wondered again, I did thank you all for your honesty, your rawness, your power, your truth for the contribution that you're giving to all of us uh, with the, with how you've just participated. And I just would love before we jump into questions with our busy bee minds to just kind of let that settle a little to kind of let us be able to kind of hear really and let those words land. So just like two, three seconds before. Thank you all. 
we would love to invite some uh, questions now. And again, just with this uh, intention um, of not so much speaking from the individual curiosities, which I know we all have a million of, but what are the questions we can ask here, which really help lift up and amplify our value as a collective and our collective learning and, uh, and understanding here. So yeah, floor is open, so to speak, chat box is open. Please type them in, Leah and I will take them and uh, we will, um, yeah, a chance to hear some more from our panelists. Any questions, any reflections people are wanting to share? Feel free to get them in the chat box. Well, while people are, are generating questions, I just wanted to follow up on Twyla's comment. You know, like um, one of, so the story growing up in Cochiti, just like Twyla, grandparents were farmers, like most people in Cochiti. We ate our blue corn. We, you know, we loved your jerky. But that was considered, you know, that's that's not that doesn't have the prestige of store bought food. But when I got to college, I remember going to the store and seeing New Mexico pine nuts, which are pinions, right? We call them pinions. There's no other name, but they had a bag for New Mexico pine nuts, and they cost like fifty dollars. And I was like, what the heck? So to me, it's like <laughs> one of Twyla's comments is like, yes, like. When Indian people eat these foods, we're considered poor. But then, like, if you have like an organic <laughs> certification, they, they cost like a whole house. I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> food prices just don't make sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Not. So we had a question. Um, asking if any, if the panel has guidance and how we can come together to support your efforts at decolonization. Okay, go. Well, I'll start really quickly. I think for me, one of the most important things, I think just building on what Twyla said, is you know, there are systems that have been in existence for thousands of years. Like my people have corn seeds that have been passed on for generations. Yet when we talk about historical narratives and we think about how agriculture is talked about in this country, indigenous people are left out. Despite the fact that there were numerous farmers up and down the Mississippi River, all the way to California. Owens Valley had sophisticated dam systems that now, so that made LA possible. The Pueblos have generations and generations of knowledge that few people had like, were literally ranching Buffalo in a, in a way that's like unfathomable in the same ways that they, you know, today, like they, like we had such sophisticated food systems. And yet when people tell the story about agriculture and the history of this country, indigenous people are not included. Right? The settlers had agriculture, the settlers made private property, the settlers civilized America. And that is just a false narrative that needs to go because it limits how people view what food systems look like and it limits who can participate in that system. And so when we, when we start challenging that narrative, it creates more room, not only for indigenous practices and people, but it also teaches us as a society to view our world differently. So like, if you wanna support indigenous people, start challenging the way we talk about food and agriculture in this country, challenge the idea about like Thanksgiving and like Indians feeding the pilgrims, like these are not helping us. These are not helping anybody. You, it may be like giving us a false sense of pride in where our country has, has come from, but it's not helping us build a better future. So please challenge those concepts and challenge the way we talk about history in America. Thank you so much. Um, and the next question from Lucas, are there any programs that you all are part of that educate people on more nutrient dense food? I 
can take that. Um, I'm part of the Western Apache Diet Project out in San Carlos, Arizona, and it's in collaboration with the four Western Apache tribes, San Carlos, White Mountain, Tonto, and um, Camp Verde. And so with those four tribes, we're able to reintroduce a, a lot of our traditional foods and reinfuse that knowledge back into today's community as well as the youth using um, different levels of tools, using the tools of the education system, the healthcare system, the judicial system, and incorporating that and collaborating with each of these programs to reintroduce our traditional foods in different levels as far as uh, working with elders and outreach and doing field trips but it's been a very, very, um, I can't never, I never like to say measure. I don't like to say success. You just like to see the outcome of what our, our elders have taught us and, and want us to continue carrying on these seeds of knowledge and seeing those seeds carried out today and seeing, make, you know, ensuring that it be carried out tomorrow. So, Again, I work with the Western Apache Diet Project out in St. Carlos, Arizona, and they're doing amazing work in collaboration with different programs and surrounding areas. Was I on mute? Okay. Thank you, Twyla. Okay. Um, and this one is to a day. How do you feel about the field of regenerative economics? Um, that's a good question because one, I've, I, I've heard the term and I know I've, I've read things about regenerative economics where you're looking at cycles of economy. And so for me, I'm, I'm still not fully sure about how I feel about it. I do think when we look at cycles and natural cycles as a society, we should be questioning the systems that accumulate resources in one places. Like when we think about water systems, when we think about um, planting systems, you know, indigenous people, when they saw like accumulation of certain animals or nutrients or water in certain places, that was our cue to say like, hey, you know, something's not flowing right. And so like, if we apply those same concepts to economic systems, like if there's an accumulation of a resource in a certain place, like we should be questioning that. And so um, I think the field of regenerative economics, I've actually read a couple of books by Paul Hawkins, you know, I think it's called The Natural Economy, which were pretty good. Um, I, you know, I'm not totally sold, but I think it's a good conversation and it's moving in the right direction. Yeah, I can feel myself with lots of questions there today. Uh, absolutely would love to dive in there. Uh, Elsie, the question has come in for yourself. Um, do you feel that Indigenous ways of scientific inquiry or obs and observation are gaining respect in academia? Um, I think that's a complex situ um, question and situation. I, I don't think so on nearly the level that they need to be um, at all. I think there are some very few realms of the scientific, Western scientific world that are beginning to think they maybe should listen to indigenous people about things. And I'm, when I, I think about that because I think about wildfire policy um, and I know that there are certain people and like you see articles coming out about like maybe we should listen to the indigenous people who were here forever before us on what we should do they're just now starting to think about um think that they should finally listen to what they've been saying for ever um and i mean i regarding fire specifically i know indigenous people in australia are listened to um far more in in that regard specifically um, and that has worked for them. 
and been very beneficial. And so I think that might be one of the reasons why people in the US are starting to think maybe they could take a note, not from the indigenous people here, but from the government in Australia that decided to listen to their indigenous people about it. And so I think that goes to show the absolute reluctance and hesitation of Western academia to put value on traditional knowledge um, knowledge that maybe they can't explain with quantitative measurements that are so reductionist and um, and the way that Western science um, works. And I say this as somebody who who did research in the Western science like sphere. Like I I used the instruments and I measured things and I did percentages, um, but that's not the only way to go about things, um, and that's not the way that that the earth works fundamentally. And traditional knowledge is about how the way the world works fundamentally. And it, in, it, it encapsulates all of the relations and the interconnectedness between concepts and different beings that is necessary to find actual solutions to the problems we face today. And so, no, I don't think academia listens to that at all. And I think people are lying to themselves if they think they that they really are because if they were we'd be in a lot different place than we are right now um and i think i do think that people are finally maybe not on a like policy level or um amongst people who have the power to do things and make make um more immediate change i don't think that conversation's happening there but I think there are a lot more specifically young people who are non-indigenous who are like pushing for um, pushing for for people to to listen and to step back and to let indigenous people um, practice um, and steward in ways that benefit everybody that that lives here. Um, so I I remain hopeful that maybe eventually. Um, people will begin to respect traditional knowledge um, on, on the level that they currently um, respect Western scientific knowledge, which is certainly not superior. I'm just gonna make some follow-up points to Elsie because what she said is really important. And one, we have to remember like reductionist thinking, which she describes serves capitalism, right? When you can, dilute something to its very component like vitamin B or like iron, you can then put that in a pill and commodify it. And so like this idea of Western science reducing and re reducing knowledge to like its essence, then creates a system which you can then commodify something. So the reductionist method serves capitalism. And the second thing that she said is like, there are indigenous scientists who are working on like the, you know, creating like paradigms that are respectful of traditional ecological knowledge, but the Western system, academia and the government shouldn't be coming to us after everything went wrong and then say, okay, traditional knowledge, help us figure this out. Like we are not reverse engineers, right? I don't have traditional knowledge for like genocide. I don't have traditional knowledge for like, these, these um, you know, like these pesticides that have been created from like man, like these are things that traditional knowledge is not gonna reverse engineer. And so like if everything went wrong and then they come to the indigenous people to like expect us to fix it, like that is not an equitable relationship. That is not what traditional knowledge is for. We are not reverse engineers, right? We are, the only way traditional knowledge works is, is that we have constant access to our lands, constant access to our people, constant access to the plants that help us maintain that knowledge. And any break in those relationships are damaging to not only our people, but to the knowledge that we carry. And so like the best thing that people can help us do to decolonize is give us access to these places and these lands and our people and the plants like that's really what we need to maintain the knowledge that would be beneficial not only to our people but to society and we are not reverse engineers
Wow, thank you. Thank you, Ade. Thank you, Elsie. Um, so we have a number of questions and we don't have a ton of time left for this Q&A. So I'm gonna kind of like choose a question that I think brings a lot of those questions together. Um, so how can we learn from indigenous people about regenerative agriculture methods, seeds, et cetera? Um, and in that question too, we had someone, another question come in about how can I, you know, how can we bring this to the Caribbean, this food sovereignty concepts that you're talking about? And another question about how can we support tribal ranchers? So I think there's a lot kind of in there to work with, but I think generally people are wondering how do we bring this forward, where we are, um, and, uh, and, and indigenize our agricultural systems. Big question. Oh, so I talk a lot and I so I was like a major pause for people could talk, but I'll start it off in Twyla and Elsie and Sanjay can follow. Um, how do we bring this forward? One, like when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, I think the most important thing is we do have to challenge what we think of agriculture. Like if indigenous people are not included in the way we first describe agriculture in this country, like including them now is gonna be really, really hard because like people are not ready to include people who haven't been included for the last 500 years. The second thing is like, we have to include people who we don't necessarily think of like as farmers or ranchers, right? Like there's people like Twyla who are constantly on the land, constantly maintaining these spaces that produce food, whether it be pine nuts, whether it be the, the mice, whether it be, or Elsie like the plains who has like, you know, this was once this was once the Buffalo Nation. They roamed this entire like I don't know the span of lots and lots and lots of states. And so like, their people maintain these spaces. But when we think about who we want to include in conversations about agriculture, like the question is like, what farm do you own? Um, are you is your farm included? in the agriculture census, or do you have like a FSA farm number? You know, these things really limit who has the conversations about how we manage our land. So like indigenous people should be included. And the third thing is like, how do we bring this forward? Like we need to give more land to indigenous people. When regenerative agriculture talks about carbon, when it talks about like carbon sinks, some of the largest carbon sinks exist in this country because indigenous are they're on indigenous lands because indigenous people have continued to steward these shrinking land bases and now they're some of the most beneficial carbon seeks in this country and so like if we want to see regenerative agriculture thrive we need to create larger carbon sinks which are like you know indigenous people need to manage those and the other thing is like, we shouldn't be just stuck on carbon. I use that carbon sink because that's what regenerative agriculture likes. But like Elsie said, like indigenous people can probably tell you where there's more carbon based on the birds that are in the area, based on the animals that are feeding in the area and based on the plants that they see. And so when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, that kind of knowledge needs to be respected. And some of the people who know that stuff are probably like, 70 year old grandma who is digging roots to make her basket like she can tell you these things but they're not always asked to be part of these conversations and so those are like my four things or three i lost count yes thank you so much and i see this question in the audience that I, has been coming through as a thread and i just want to put it out there now we won't we won't touch on it now maybe we'll ask the panelists at the very end to touch on it which is um how for folks who are non-Indigenous to do, to, to learn from these Indigenous uh, ways of life and Indigenous agriculture without being appropriative. So I'm sort of gonna plant the seed of that thought and then, um, and then I'll pass it to, and I just wanna say thank you. That was incredible. I mean, the chat box just went totally crazy. Everyone just has so many questions for you all. So 
Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but we will pass them forward to the panelists after the fact if they if they want to, you know, answer some afterwards. And so in an email or something. So I'll pass it to Brona and we can organize for breakout rooms. Welcome back from breakout rooms. Sorry if we interrupted your amazing conversations. We there's just been so much uh, abundance in this in this panel that I think that we just keep stretching everything. And so, thank you all for being with us. And uh, yeah, I will um, pass it to. Or is this? Oh, I'm 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 gonna do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, this is just a final lightning round, and so. Basically, we just want to ask uh, the, of the panelists your final remarks. What is bubbling up for you? What is emergent for you? What's something you just want, want to make sure you say before you head out? And I can call on folks too. Let's see. Um, Twyla. OK, go ahead, say it again. Uh, the question is, what are what are your final remarks? Things you just want to make sure you say before we all head out. Um, what's bubbling up for you? Um, on the first part, on the final remark is just a moment just to recognize our elders, our ancestors, and the knowledge that they're able to carry on and continue to carry with us, and for us to carry on to the next generation and further. Um, to you know, just to be have an open mind of, of an open mind and mindfulness when working with indigenous communities and also to help support indigenous um, farmers in your local areas, you know, to help support, um, how you say, and did, how you say, our, our local native farmers, you know, help help empower them. So with that, I would say thank you. Thank you for allowing me time to be here and a time and allowing me time to share some words. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Twyla. And next, Sanjay. Final remarks. Again, I'm I'm just grateful for the work you guys are doing. I think it's critical for people to understand that this country. America was founded on an agricultural system and a system of exporting value from the land. We don't necessarily have a fundamental way to honor the land as being its own element, rivers as being their own beings without trying to find ways to extract that wealth. So fundamentally, the way our economic system is, is operating is antithetical to indigenous life ways. We spoke in our own little breakout panel of the importance of not trying to copy indigenous people, but giving them the leadership positions, letting them lead again, as they did on Turtle Island for 10,000 plus years. And uh, we've all made a mess of it. And it's uh, time that we develop some humility, not just to people, but to mother earth in general. Wow, thank you so much, Sanjay. Um, and Elsie. Yeah, um, I suppose my last little thought is going to just slightly touch a little more on um, people who always ask what they can do and, and, and that and to just preface with saying that, like, frankly, nothing that anybody does is going to work unless it's coming from a good place and unless they're doing it in a good way. And that requires some deep internal reflection and decompartmentalizing um, of concepts and decolonization of concepts within one's own mind and heart. And, and that really like seems like this impossible um, task and this really hard, um, not tangible thing to do, but it is, and it's a necessary thing to do before any efforts um, are going to, I mean, not that you can't, this is not like an excuse um, to, to not take action to um, say financially or 
um, land-wise uh, support indigenous initiatives um, and people. But when we're talking specifically like, oh, how do I get in involved in like indigenous land stewardship? Like, well, you you don't, like you, you have to, as uh, Sanjay was saying, and as Twyla and Ade were talking about in our discussion before, like it has to be indigenous people at the forefront and to be able to understand and reckon with that, people have to come to terms with their own relationships um, with, with the other beings on this planet um, and, and really switch up a lot of perspectives that a lot of us and myself included um, have. And, and that, that, that's some deep personal work that's gotta happen. And I invite everybody to engage with some of that really uncomfortable stuff because it's necessary. Thank you for that, inviting that, that discomfort as a part of it and that humility. Thanks, Lucy. A day, last but certainly not least. Yes, um, and I'm gonna just give a shout out to Ariel because what I'm gonna share with the group really comes from growing up in Kochiti and Ariel and me have, are cut off the same cloth, so this will make sense to her. Um, you know, we talked a lot about language in this webinar, and language is really, really important. What we name things and what we call things, like pretty much set up how we, they're predetermined relationships once you give something a name. And so like the lands we are on have names. The indigenous people we act, we interact with have names. I'm Kiowa and Kochiti, you know, like Twyla has a name for her people and so does Elsie. And it's important that we use those names. Like it's sometimes, we, and those things get lost when we say indigenous or American Indian, but we all have names. And when we talk about language, I'm gonna share with you my most favorite word in Kochiti, which is sitoni, right? And sitoni, is like a form of thank you. There's no equivalent in the English language, but usually you, you tell that to somebody after they bring you a cup of water, which is like, and you say tsitoni, and it means like, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart that I hope you will grow mentally and you will grow physically and you will grow with your family and you will grow with your people and you will grow with your environment. And all of that is said in one word. Sitoni. And my hope is that someday we will live in a society where we have such simple words to describe the most important relationship um, that we have, not only with our lands, with our people, but with ourselves and each other. So thank you. Sitoni. Wow, what a beautiful word and what a beautiful offering. Thank you, Ade. And Brona, would you? like to guide us out. Sure, I just want to acknowledge it is now 2 p.m. and uh, I know some of the panelists need to go and I just want to say the huge, huge thank you. Uh, I want to make visible the amount of work that uh, you all need to do in order to kind of come in and be in this kind of conversation with us, like the interpretation, the translation, the emotional work, like the labor that you're all doing to help us kind of uh, like to shift our understandings. Thank you for really doing that. Thank you for doing that work. Uh, I would love the participants to check out with, um, with an offer of gratitude by, back into this space to you to like, what is a gift? participants what is a gift you have taken from the session and what is a gratitude you would like to offer back to our panelists uh, panelists if you need to go please do we'll make sure that you get these uh, we just want to acknowledge a huge thanks um thank you so much and participants we can kind of uh, offer some next steps as well but thank you what is a gift you're taking from this session and what is a gratitude you would like to offer back into these uh, to these four wonderful humans? I keep calling you panelists, just wonderful humans, but also work. Folks, we'll send these to you as a little like. Thank you. Here's some words of gratitude. Um, 
Leah, is there a next steps? Like, oh, sorry, whatever. What's happening next, Leah? <laughs> My brain has also stopped working. Yeah, what next is just our thank yous. It's, it's all thank yous from here on out. Thank you to you all, the panelists, the humans, the people that made this all possible. Thanks to the staff, the volunteers, the sponsors, and all the participants for being so engaged and open-hearted today. Um, we invite you to carry forward all that you learned and embody today and um, think about what you're going to commit to in your learning and in your actions moving forward. Um, and just we have some announcements. Workshops are continuing this week. Um, Friday's panel, the Good Meat Breakdown, is open to everyone. And um, next week, our final round of plenaries, Monday and Wednesday, 12 to 2, and closing activities on Thursday to, to bring the conference to a sweet end. And yeah, we just hope you keep coming back on this learning journey, wishing you all a peaceful day. So much gratitude. Thanks all.